Okay, we are now recording. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is our Tuesday morning Bible study, turning a new page. We have been <laughs> for the longest time, we've been studying the Gospel of Matthew. By my reckoning, we were an entire year on the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, starting, I think, back in November of uh, about a year ago, uh, right now, um, we did have a break of about a month because of the pandemic. We, we, I despaired of being able to meet by Zoom, but then we reached a crucial point where uh, folks were a willing to stick with it and b willing to uh, go an extra mile and learn how to get on Zoom. And so we got everybody on and it's, it's been successful since. So now we're beginning a, a new study, the book of Genesis, the book of foundations. Uh, and I'm very, very excited about it. Um, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna share with you a handout. Now I did send it to you, but I wanna put it up on your screen. Uh, and I'd like to just very briefly go through it, chat about some of it. It's just some recommendations uh, for Bibles and resources and websites that as we go through this, and this is, you know, this is a long-term Bible study by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Genesis is longer than Matthew is. And, <laughs> and if we follow a similar thing, we'll, we'll be with this for a long time. Um, it'll, it'll only be two or three years. Don't it'll worry. It'll only be two or three years. And <laughs> As I said, I am recording these sessions. So if you, you know, if you have to miss for a period of time, you can always go back and, and catch up on the material that, that you did miss. Uh, but I'm Lois. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna share this screen here. Okay. And I'm gonna show you a handout. There we go. Okay. That was the email. Hey, hold on, let me. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> After many journeys through different parts of the Bible, we go back to the beginning, the book of Genesis. We're going to be looking at the book of Genesis from a historical, metaphorical point of view, taking it seriously, but not literally, with great attention to historical and literary context. And uh, those of you who have been with me for the Gospel of Matthew know that that's always the point of view that, that uh, is taken uh, in this Bible study. Um, but my contention has always been that when we do this, when we take it seriously, but not literally, it actually yields results that are surprisingly rich and relevant, reaffirming its present day significance as sacred <laughs> scripture. Um, there is one introduction to reading the Bible in this way that I, want, I do wanna recommend. Some of you have heard of this book. It's called Reading the Bible Again for the First Time, Taking the Bible Seriously, But Not Literally. Um, because reading the Bible well is, is not quite as simple as just picking it up and reading it. And this is especially true with the book of Genesis. Because the Bible, both Old and New Testament, but very much the book of Genesis, is an ancient library of texts written over a thousand years by dozens of unknown authors in wildly different places, contexts, and literary genres. And therefore, it demands to be approached with historical and literary understanding, and that this informed approach, one that takes account of historical and literary truth, um, is integral, not peripheral or opposed, to our reading the text as sacred scripture and discerning the word of God in our own day. Uh, right here, um, and this is contra what my dear friend Bill says, but um, <laughs> I do recommend uh, for serious study of the Bible and uh, book of Genesis in particular, uh, the New Revised Standard Version as the, uh, that's sort of, those of, those of, well, almost, almost, yeah, I, way, way to go. Well, my, go, my, wife, my wife has that. She, she, she is one of these uh, uh, who, who likes this one rather than the King James that I like, so. Yeah, I, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bill, Bill and I have a running thing. Bill, Bill is a passionate devotee of the King James Version, and I can appreciate that. I certainly can appreciate it. Uh, but for, for the kind of study that we're doing, the New Revised Standard is probably the most useful. Um, and when you have it in a study Bible edition, as Bill just showed, 
um, that's that's really the kind of the best of all worlds because it has annotations which are scholarly informed. Uh, they have, uh, it has notes and maps and other study aids. Um, so for serious study of uh, the Bible and the book of Genesis in particular, the NRSV, an NRSV-based study Bible is a really good thing to have. Um, as far as commentaries and studies on the book of Genesis uh, that may assist you as we go through this, I mean, you always have things that I say and things that we say uh, in discussion. Um, but I will say that, uh, you know, picking up a, a commentary on Genesis will, will help along. It will help the study process and, and really taking in and appreciating what you're being exposed to. Um, a reliable scholarly commentary that I especially would recommend is uh, one by Walter Brueggemann, uh, simply called Genesis, and it's in the Interpretation Bible Commentary series. Um, two other studies that I have helpful are Genesis Translation and Commentary by the uh, Cal Berkeley Hebrew professor Robert Alter and Understanding Genesis, the World of the Bible in the Light of History by uh, Nahum Sarna. Um, I also list some good one volume commentaries which cover the entire Bible uh, with good treatments of Genesis. Um, you'll see Erdman's, Harper Collins, New Interpreters. Um, and I, and I say, it's always nice to have one of those because uh, that way you'll have a commentary on the whole Bible. So, you know, in, in a generation, when we finish the book of Genesis, uh, you'll, you'll have, you'll be in good stead for the next book we choose. Um, there is a, a book that I can also recommend. It's, it's for more advanced study of the literary sources that make up Genesis and the process by which they were woven together. Um, I mention it, number one, because I find it, I have found it very useful, very helpful uh, when we, as we prepare to dig deep and to really look at these texts closely, um, but also because he's a Uni University of Georgia professor, uh, Richard Elliott Friedman, uh, a book called The Bible with Sources Revealed, A New View into the Five Books of Moses. Um, absolutely outstanding. It's, it's very technical. It can be very technical. And so it's, you know, it's, it's not light reading, but it's, um, I will, I would say whether you ever look at it or not, I will say it does go to inform me, inform me in, in the information that I'm, uh, that I present to you. Uh, always, always a good thing to have a good Bible dictionary, a uh, good Bible atlas. Uh, the book of Genesis in particular is full of uh, ancient historical references and obscure place names. Um, and so it's really good to have a Bible dictionary that you can look stuff up in. Um, it's also nice to have a good Bible atlas uh, showing you the ancient Near East and the land of the, of the Bible to help you, just to help you kind of get oriented about where we are and where things happen, okay? Uh, then finally, I'll just mention these uh, two online resources. Um, one is uh, BibleGateway.com which is a very useful site for reading and comparing multiple Bible translations next to each other. You can see how they're different. Uh, I would not use this site for any other purpose, such as its Bible study resources. Um, one that I would use uh, and trust very much for its Bible study resources is BibleOdyssey.org, which is absolutely superb for researching the origins of the Bible and its eventful history. Um, so that is that. Now, let me show you something else here. Right there. This right here is a map of the ancient Near East. Every single thing, every event, everything we're going to talk about in the book of Genesis takes place somewhere on this map. All right. Um, uh, 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 if you just reading the Gen book of Genesis on a, on a barely literal level, um, human civilization begins, begins in Mesopotamia, begins in the Fertile Crescent. You'll see the, uh, you'll see Mesopotamia, uh, going kind of diagonally, uh, in what is today, uh, Iraq, uh, and you'll notice the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, this is one, historically speaking, this is one of 
the two or three great centers of the earliest human civilizations. Um, the other, the, really the other alongside it is the Nile River civilization in Egypt. Um, but it is from Mesopotamia that so much of the rest of the biblical story emerges. It's where Abraham comes from. It's the land that he leaves when he follows God's mysterious call to go into a new land that God will show him. Uh, <clears throat> you'll see, of course, the uh, what is today Israel. Uh, it's easy to pick out the Dead Sea. You know what the Dead Sea looks like. Um, so Israel, the land of Canaan, uh, and all of that, and um, and where those places stand in relation to Egypt, who is a nation which is also going to show up a lot in our discussions of Genesis. All right, I am now going to, to go away from this map and I'm gonna go away from this and I'm going to stop the screen share. Okay, so now we're back, now we're back to this. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about what I mean by a historical metaphorical approach to the book of Genesis. I don't want to belabor it uh, because we have the book of Genesis to talk about today, but I do want to just say a few words about what I mean by historical metaphorical approach. The first thing is uh, as regards historical, that whatever else may be true of the book of Genesis, it is first of all a human document one that reflects multiple sources, very ancient and diverse cultural contexts, and as we will see, varying points of view. And therefore, we can't read it faithfully to understand this fact. We don't seek to understand the different voices and the different contexts and the rich history that lies underneath all of it. We can't read it well if we don't do that. Um, and it is in that way that a literalist reading actually does violence to the text. It actually distorts the meaning of the text. Because when we read it, liter when we li read it literally, we can't possibly be appreciating the different points of view. There are, as we will see later, there are different accounts of the same event that are in tension with one another because they come from two different sources. And the redactor, the redactors that ultimately compiled the book of Genesis in the 400s BC had so much respect for the sources that they often would juxtapose the two sources and not attempt to resolve them, not, not att even attempt to resolve them. Mm -hmm but simply leaving them side by side. Now, we will see also that there's, besides respecting the sources, there's also some artistry going on when the redactors did that, because it made possible then a number of wonderful large-scale symmetries in the text where, well, it, it's, it will be easier to explain uh, in about two weeks when I show you the first great example of this, but some wonderful symmetries that are there by design, not by accident. And, and they're astonishing. They're really astonishing. Um, and so, so as I say, a literalist reading of the text um, really does violence to the text and it doesn't allow these multiple voices to speak. Um, the second thing is, is that uh, we're doing a metaphorical approach um, based on the idea that texts have levels of meaning that go beyond their historical particularity or their historical factuality or lack of it. It's not inappropriate for us to ask if a story or an event really happened. It's not inappropriate to ask that at all. But the meaning and the significance of the stories transcend that question, okay? They transcend that question. Um, and this is gonna be true with respect to the accounts of Adam and Eve and the flood and 
the 900 year lifespans of, you know, the patriarchs. I mean, we can ask if, you know, that's literally true, we can. But again, the meaning, the significance of these stories transcend that question, transcend whether it's historically accurate or not. In a way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in, in many cases whether something literally happened or not. The truth is, is that the book of Genesis is full of a combination of authentic historical memory, you know, I mean, real, I mean, like real life people and real life events combined with metaphorical narrative that is not necessarily what literally happened. And it's all woven together. And what we are then gifted with is a grand narrative that we get to engage with and engage with at varying levels of interpretation and meaning. And that's a rich, relevant uh, truth. Um, let me give a brief example while my mother is still here of uh, an example of what I mean, a, a mix of historical factuality with metaphorical narrative. Um, in, my, in, in, in my family, uh, one of the revered figures in our family history that is no longer with us is my mother's mother, my grandmother. Uh, we called her Wiggy, and, or I called her Wiggy, and then everyone else called her Wiggy. I made up this name when I was three years old and thought it was very funny, and it, it stuck. It just stuck, and then later on, everyone called her Wiggy. Um, my grandmother lived a rich life. She, she lived she, uh, when she, uh, and when she was younger, I mean, she was vivacious and uh, beautiful, vivacious, and, and just uh, threw herself into life. And the result of that is that she had so many great stories about growing up in Anniston, Alabama, uh, you know, uh, being a young woman. I think, you know, the story goes like engaged five different times to four different men who were not my grandfather. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, things like that. I mean, just some rich, wonderful stories. And we would, you know, after she, after she left us, um, you know, I mean, we, we would continue to tell and retell all these stories, right? Now, do I know after, you know, after all these years of telling and retelling these stories, do I know for a fact that every single detail of those stories fact are factual, literally happened as told. No, no one does. Only my grandmother would know the, would know the literal factual truth of the matter. The stories, no doubt, over the years have, have been altered, have been sometimes mm -hmm told unconsciously in a different way for the moment. You know, we simply, we simply don't have access to that. We don't know, and there's no way to know. Now, are those stories, but, but if those stories are not necessarily 100% historically factual, does that mean that they're worthless? Of course not, of course not. Because whether they're 100% historically factual or not, they succeed in the task for which they are told. And that is to bring my grandmother back to life. That when we tell those stories, we evoke her spirit. We, we, we meet her. We interact with that person that was her, that was Wiggy. And that is the function that is the function of a good story. One that is a mix of historical memory and metaphorical narrative. That's the purpose. It's the purpose of the stories is not to necessarily relay 100% historically factual information. It is to take us, is to take us back into a world, take us back to meet people and, and engage with questions of meaning and significance and so that's what we're doing with the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. We approach the Bible this way. Mm -hmm. 
it's okay if certain things didn't necessarily literally happen because they are nevertheless transporting us to dimensions of meaning and significance that we would not have access to but for these stories. Um, and so that's, that's what I want to get across. And uh, uh, that's, what, that's what I want to get across. I, I love that example because I think it's so, I think it's so, uh, so spot on. All right. <clears throat> Let us now talk about the book of Genesis. And this is uh, in the way of a broad overview of Genesis, okay? Um, and then next week, we're going to start opening our Bibles and, and digging into the text, start reading the text uh, verse by verse. Um, but in the way of a broad overview of Genesis, I want to talk about its basic themes, basic message. Uh, I want to say a little bit about its structure and then talk a little bit about its sources and how it was compiled and when. Uh, all of this is, I think, a good foundation to then next week dig into the text and We'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a foundation of knowledge uh, to take with us as we dig into the text and we discuss it. Um, I said earlier that the book of Genesis was, seems to have been compiled in its final form. And it's in the form, the, uh, the form that we know it today in the 400s BC, following the Babylonian exile, which was in the 500s BC. Um, and so coming into its final form in the 400s BC, Genesis is the foundational first book of the Bible. It is Israel telling its own story and placing itself in a larger context of nations and of history and portrays a God who is active in history to fulfill God's purposes. Now in another class, one that uh, Lois, uh, Lois knows very well, um, I argued that the central story of the Old Testament, the foundational story of the Old Testament uh, is, is Exodus. It's the, the, the freedom, uh, the freeing the Israelite slaves from Egypt. That's the center of the Old Testament and really the thing from which everything else flows. The book of Genesis, though, is that essential, that essential prelude showing that God was at work in mysterious ways. God was at work before Israel was constituted as a people. It's kind of like kind of another way of saying the same thing is you can reflect on your own relationship with God and, and you can think about your own life. Um, you know, in one way or another, I've, I've been in a relationship with God all my life. But what's really, what's really sobering is that God was around, God knew me, God knew you, before, right? Uh, I mean, and, and that, I don't mean that in such a literal way, but it is a, it is a poetic expression of something that I think is profoundly spiritually true. Um, that God was at work before you were a glimmer in your parents' eyes. <laughs> um, and so in the same way, so in, the, in a similar way anyway, God was at work in the history of Israel before Israel even existed. And Genesis tells the story of how Israel came to be got to a place you'll notice that the very last scenes in genesis are take place in egypt and that's then the prep the preparation for exodus chapter one okay uh, <clears throat> so structurally speaking we have four big sections in genesis chapters one through eleven are known as the primordial history, chapters one through 11. Um, one through 11 in many ways stands distinct from all the rest. In some ways you could say they're two parts of Genesis, the first 11 chapters and then everything else. Okay. 
But 1 through 11 is the primordial history. This is where we have Adam and Eve and the flood and a uh, spectacularly long lifespan and um, the Tower of Babel and uh, the Table of Nations and, and all of that. Um, we have the primordial history. Then the rest of it are three cycles, three cycles focusing, each focusing on an individual or an individual's family. Chapter 12 through chapter 25, verse 18, is the Abraham cycle. The story of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Chapter 25, verse 19, through the end of chapter 36, is the Jacob cycle. Oh, there's so much to talk about when we get to Jacob. And then chapters 37 through 50 is the Joseph cycle. And the whole story of, jo of Joseph and his coat of many colors and his devious brothers and him going down to Egypt. All right. <clears throat> Let me just say a few things about each of these sections. Bye, bye Mom. Bye, honey. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> say a few things about uh, chapters 1 through 11. The primordial history. Um, Chapters 1 through 11 uh, introduce God, reflect on the human condition, reflect on a time that in a quite almost literal way is prehistorical. Because once we get into the, the events of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob after, in chapter 12 and forward, we're getting into... Um, we're getting into a, a story that has solid, locatable historical uh, roots. Okay, I mean, like, like, like a time where we can almost talk about when, when these, when did Abraham live? When did these things happen? Before that, it's more in the realm of timeless story, uh, kind of a kind of a golden age of beginnings that can't be necessarily located in on a calendar or in a or in a particular place although the whole narrative 1 through 11 is deeply rooted culturally in the uh, the, the the great myths of Mesopotamia Babylonia all right <clears throat> so in the primordial history we do have the creation but we don't have one story of creation. We have two, one in chapter one, and then the other story of creation, chapters two and three. Uh, as in a minute, I'll be talking about the different sources uh, that made up Genesis. But chapter one comes from one of those sources. Chapters two and three come from another source. And they are, they are in tension with one another, and yet both exist side by side. The people who wove the entire composition together did respect the sources. And even when juxtaposing two stories in tension, does a beautiful job of tying them together. And we'll, we'll see how that works later on. Of course, with the creation come the creation of Adam and Eve in the garden, and then their expulsion from the garden. Uh, then uh, of course their children, uh, which gives rise to the first murder. And uh, not uh, coincidentally, followed by the rise of civilization. <laughs> In some way, you could say that civiliz that according to Genesis, uh, the roots of civilization are in violence. Uh, there have been many scholars who have made, uh, made a, an argument like that. Um, <clears throat> and then goes on to, to uh, tell of a line of descent from Adam to about 10 generations later to Noah. And Noah, of course, is the uh, protagonist of the great flood, uh, which ha happens in chapters six through nine. Once again, we have two flood stories. They're not necessarily juxtaposed as in like, like chapter six is one, chapter seven is another. They're actually woven together. And sometimes you have, you know, like if I ask you how many, how many animals how many, how many of each kind of animal went on the, onto the ark? You know, 
there's not a simple answer to that question. Because in one place it says two, in other place <laughs> where it speaks of, of uh, clean animals, it was seven, pa seven pairs of each <coughs> species went onto the ark. And, it, and the, here again, these are two, two sources that are coming from different points of view, telling the, of the same event, but in a different way. Uh, sometimes those differences aren't going to matter. Sometimes they are going to matter, but not in a negative way. They're going to matter in a positive way because they actually help us help to illuminate, um, help to illuminate some 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 deeper meanings that we can derive from them. Um, following the flood, it it, it, uh, it depicts uh, all the descendants of Noah making up a table of nations, um, elaborate genealogies. Um, but they all seem to be more or less situated in the same place, right? They all seem to be situated in Mesopotamia. Well, obviously, if we're going to have a populated world, that can't continue. And so in chapter 11, we have the story of the Tower of Babel, which then is, this is a big word. And I, if I, if I thought, had thought about it, I would splash it up onto the screen. A uh, big SAT word, etiology. Anyone know what etiology means? That means the cause of. Yes, yes. An etiology is a, is a story that explains why something is the way it is, right? And the Tower of Babel story is an etiology for why you have all these, all these <laughs> languages and nations speaking those languages spread out all over the world. Now, you know, the historical question aside, it's pretty obvious that it, that didn't happen his, in historical time, but it nevertheless is a story with profound theological and spiritual significance. And we'll delve deep into that when we get to that chapter. Um, moving on then to the Abraham cycle, chapters uh, 12 through 25, 18. Um, you know, of course, we have the call of Abraham to leave Haran, to leave Mesopotamia and to go to a land that God will show him. And it's all based on a promise, based on a promise of land and of descendants. And you could say that the central theme that really lies or lies behind or, or is within the entire book of Genesis is a theme of promise and fulfillment. God makes promises and then God fulfills promises. Um, <clears throat> but there are barriers. And that's why the book of Genesis is such a wonderful story. Because yes, God is there and God makes promises and God works behind the scenes to fulfill promises, but there are barriers. There are things in the story that make, make it hard to fulfill the promises. And I'll just give a few examples. And if, you know, and if you've been around the book of Genesis, you know, in the past, you'll you'll recognize these things. Um, sometimes the promise that God makes is just hard to believe. <laughs> it's just hard to believe. You know, hundred hundred year old Abraham, ninety year old Sarah being told they're going to have children. <laughs> that that, that Sarah is going to be in the maternity ward soon. You know, that is an intrinsically hard thing to believe, and yet God says it. And he evidently expects Abraham to believe it. Um, so promises hard to believe. Promises delayed. Think of all the years that passed from the time God first made a promise to Abraham about descendants to the point that Isaac was born. That was a while. And so Abraham had to keep the faith thing going. He had to not falter. He had to keep it going in order for the promise to see its uh, fulfillment. Um, there are a series of barren women, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Talk about barriers to a promise getting fulfilled where, where the promise is descendants, okay? Abraham's wife is barren. Isaac's wife is barren. Jacob's preferred wife is barren. It's just... It's just like the author, if the author is 
making up a story. The author is making up a story to give God as much hard stuff to work with as possible. To, <laughs> to just make it naturally impossible for God to make good on his word. Okay. So what are the chances that it wasn't the women that were barren? <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Just saying. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Yep, uh, that's not how the because story was always told, that but, I, but your point of is, course told, it, your point of is, course it wasn't told that way, <laughs> I mean, right? Because it's who would believe that, right? Man could possibly, yeah, yeah, it's the men, it's be the problem. Not the They're not gonna write that in there, no. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so you, you have, uh, you have, you have uh, the you know, accounts of barren women, you have the loss of women, at least temporarily, to others. Um, in chapters 12, 20, and 26, we're going to see examples of where Abraham, and then later in chapter 26, Isaac, temporarily lose their wives to uh, neighborhood kings who just can't resist the beauty of the wives and takes Abraham's wife, and then later Isaac's wife, for himself, only, only to find out that the the woman he took, the woman the, that the king took, was not Abraham's sister, but his wife. And then plagues start happening because of this, and ultimately the truth comes out and. So you have this running theme of Abraham telling a king that his wife is actually his sister and, and it goes all crazy. And then and that actually happens twice, if you can believe it. It happens in chapters 12 and 20. And then later on, the exact theme shows up again in the life of Isaac. So again, I present this, I present it kind of as a comical aspect of, of this, but I also present it as a barrier to God's promise being fulfilled. And so it's part of the narrative, the way it's written is to, pre to present as many roadblocks to God getting the job done, right? Uh, you also have, of course, have detours in Egypt uh, and elsewhere. You have tons of family strife. Now, you know, of, of, of bickering and arguments within families. Uh, the best example, of course, is between Jacob and Esau. That's going to be the, I mean, that's like the classic brother against brother kind of story. But again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's principal significance from the larger point of view is that it presents a barrier to the divine promise being fulfilled. Um, and that is, of course, the third of the four, uh, the, the second of the third cycles, the Jacob cycle, uh, chapter 25, verse 19 through 36, 43. Um, the entire Jacob cycle in some ways folk, uh, functions as an etiology, an etiology of why Israel seems to have such <laughs> bad relationship with neighbors. <laughs> and it's because it's rooted, it's rooted in the very family that they come from. Uh, because Esau is, you know, later on is said to be the ancestor of the Edomites. Uh, and the Edomites and the Israelites you know, we're always at it. And the reason that is, so the, the author of the narrative says, is because it goes right back to the beginning when Jacob and Esau were butting heads. Uh, and that became then the kernel of a destiny to unfold. <clears throat> then finally, in chapters 37 through 50, the Joseph cycle, the story of Joseph, who was the son of Jacob, uh, being sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, Joseph the dreamer, uh, being, being sold into slavery in Egypt. He's far, far away from anything. He has dreams. Are they going to be fulfilled? It doesn't look like it. He's a slave in Egypt. It doesn't look like his dreams are going to be fulfilled. And yet God is at work mysteriously. And Joseph rises up to be the second most powerful man in Egypt, and he saves 
He saves the entire region from famine. He saves his brothers who are the ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel. And, that, and that's why they are in Egypt, which then leads into the account of the Exodus. Mm -hmm. And so you see how all of this, this is a grand, grand story that then leaves us in Egypt and prepares us for the book of Exodus. Now, finally, in the way of preparation, before we start digging into the text, I want to talk about the different sources that are involved here. Um, as you probably know, the book of Genesis is traditionally ascribed to the prophet Moses. Uh, that, that is you know, sacred tradition in the, in the Jewish and Christian traditions. Um, it wasn't really until about the 17th, 17th or 18th century that there began to be doubt cast about that as a literal fact. Um, today, today, no reputable scholar would, would tell you that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And, and, and the, the, reason why, the reason why it's clear that one person didn't write it is because if one person were writing it, that one person wouldn't put Genesis chapter one and chapters two and three side by side with each other, uh, wouldn't put it's clear, it's clear that the book of Genesis contains multiple voices, multiple hands. Um, and the last two 150 years of historical scholarship on the Bible has broadly concluded, and I, I stress broadly because there's a lot of room for wiggle in the details, okay, but have broadly spoken of four different sources, whether, whether you think of them as documents, I mean, things that were like actual written sources, or if you think of them as pre-literary oral traditions, or schools of tradition, lines of tradition. Either way, you have four distinct, four distinct uh, groupings or sources. Um, the first, is called by scholars, it's called the J source. It's called the J source uh, because it stands for Yahwist, as in uh, when J is pronounced uh, with a Y sound, uh, uh, Yahwist, which is based on the idea that the Yahwist source prefers to use the Hebrew word Yahweh when referring to God. Okay? That's, that's not the only distinctive thing about the Yahwist source, but it is what gives it that source its name. It prefers to use the word Yahweh when uh, speaking of God. Um, the J source seems to have its roots in the kingdom of Judah, in the southern kingdom of Judah, in probably between the 10th and the 9th century BC. So probably in a period that is roughly lining up with about the days of King Solomon, okay? probably after King David, probably in the days of King Solomon, um, this body of tradition seems to have coalesced in some fashion, uh, providing us then a distinctive voice that will later go on to be included as part of Genesis. Um, the J source provides us um, narrative that is earthy, it's human, it presents God in a very anthropomorphic way, okay? For example, you may remember uh, in uh, the Garden of Eden story where it speaks of how God was walking in the garden and Adam and Eve heard God walking in the garden and because they had just eaten the forbidden fruit, they went and hid themselves, okay? Later on, you may remember that wonderful detail about how Noah, after the flood, made a sacrifice, made a sacrifice to God, and God smelled the smoke of the sacrifice and found the odor pleasing, okay? That's the J source. 
Okay. That those stories, those stories where God is very human-like. That's the J source. And it presents God in this way, but it also presents human beings in a very rich and earthy and conflicted way. Okay. Uh, and it's from the J source that we get this running theme of promise and fulfillment. So the J source is immensely important for our study of Genesis. The second source is the Elohist source. It starts with an E, Elohist, Elohist. And it is so named because the Elohist source prefers the use of the word Elohim to describe God, to name God, as opposed to the Yahwist, which uses the word Yahweh to, to name God. Uh, the Elohist source uses Elohim. Uh, Elohim is, is a word that speaks of God, speaks of God in God's divine majesty. Uh, I, Lisa and I were just watching The Crown uh, on Netflix. We just finished it. I wish there were more episodes, but uh, we just finished it. And you know, can you imagine, not so much Elizabeth, uh, but more like Elizabeth's great-great-grandmother, uh, uh, Queen Victoria. Can you imagine Queen Victoria saying, we are not amused? <laughs> and she says, we, we are not amused. Now, when she says we are not amused, she doesn't really mean we are not amused. She means I am not amused, right? <laughs> but she's using we as a kind of, we call it a plural of majesty, a plural of majesty. We are not amused. Um, Elohim is, is technically a plural noun. The im, the im on the Elohim, the im makes it plural. And so it's, it's what we, what referred to God, then it's God speaking in the divine royal we. Okay, so that's the best way I know how to explain that. Um, the Elohist source seems to be uh, associated with the northern kingdom of Israel sometime probably in the 8th century BC, uh, prior to the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel by the, by the Assyrian Empire. Um, the El some of the marks of the Elohist source are dreams angels, visions. The Elohist source loves to tell you about somebody having a dream. When almost the entire Joseph cycle is told from the Elohist source, okay? Because the whole narrative of Joseph is driven by Joseph's having, Joseph having dreams. That comes from the Elohist source. Uh, the, what we know about Joseph mostly comes from the Elohist source. Um, uh, now, round about, round about the 7th century BC, the J source and the E source, Yahwist and Elohist, were combined by, uh, by creative redactor and combined into what is known as the old epic. Um, and so that's, that's the first step in what would lead to the final uh, compilation of the book of Genesis. Now we have two other sources, one of which doesn't appear in Genesis at all, but is important for the first five books of the Bible. Uh, the third source is the priestly source, okay? The P source, in other words. <laughs> now the priestly source is very different, very different in language and tone from the J and E source, and especially from the J source. The P source, the priestly source, sees God in a very transcendent way, in a very holy way, the exact opposite of how the Yahwist source sees God. The Yahwist source sees God as very anthropomorphic, as very human. The priestly source sees God as transcendent and high and lifted up and almost inaccessible to, almost inaccessible to human beings. Um, it, is, uh, it is a source that depends very much on on, on uh, the importance of ritual and genealogies and dates. 
uh, the great genealogies of Genesis come to us from the P source. Uh, Genesis chapter one, where God creates the heavens and the earth, uh, let there be light and there was light and God saw that the light was good and he called the light day and he called it and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. God as the transcendent creator of all that is speaking creation into existence. That's the peace source. That's the theology of the peace source is this transcendent creator. <clears throat> And then finally, there's a source that doesn't appear in Genesis, but is important, and that's the, uh, the D source, the Deuteronomic source, which is basically the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, and that comes to us from probably uh, the time of just before and during the Babylonian exile. Oh, for, oh actually, I did omit something. The priestly source uh, comes to us most likely from the time of the exile, the time of the Babylonian exile, or just after it. Okay, that's when the peace source really coalesced. That's going to be important. You may think, well, what do, all, what do all these dates mean? Why does it matter that something came to us from the 6th century BC, blah, blah, blah? You know, Tom, you're just showing, showing off, you know, what you learned in ancient history class. No, no, that is not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm setting up for next week's look at Genesis 1. Because knowing that Genesis 1 comes to us from the priestly source is immensely important in our proper interpretation of it. Oh, and to give you a preview, it sets us up to see Genesis chapter one, not as some kind of scientific treatise on the creation of the universe, but rather a, 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 poetry, a, a poetry of imperial subversion. <laughs> okay, so a, a poetry of imperial subversion. And you would never ever, no one would ever figure that out, but for, but for the historical scholarship that has illuminated the sources. And when we understand that it, Genesis 1 did come from the priestly source and what the priestly source was dealing with, what the priests of that time were, were trying to do, what their agenda was, that we can understand what Genesis 1 is and why it was written, okay? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a, a teaser for next week, okay? Well, with that, we have what I believe to be the necessary foundation for looking at the book of Genesis in an informed way uh, with the right categories, uh, the right historical foundation to, to really understand what we are studying. Um, and so next week, I, I, again, I promise Genesis 1-1. One, one. Welcome back, Bill. <laughs> Welcome back, Bill. Thank you. I'm sorry. I had to go pick Sharon up from, but we're, we're going to sit and watch the whole thing together. You, how do I get to it on your site? Um, I'll send you, um, I'll, I'll send you a link. That'd probably be the easiest way to do it. I'll just send you a link to the video. I literally had to tear myself away. Genesis is my favorite book of the Bible. And as you know, I'm fond of the King James Version when I'm reading it. Exactly. But it's so refreshing to have someone with an intellect to go through this once more. So thank okay. you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, yes, I'll send you the link direct. I'll send the link to all of you. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be complete in just a few hours after, after we finish. Um, but uh, but uh, anyway, but for Bill, I was just ex I was just wrapping up actually, and just explaining that next week we dig into Genesis chapter one verse one, and uh, we go to it. Uh, but just saying that we have now you know uh, laid the foundations, uh, you know brought out the the categories that we need to to ask the right questions and to approach the text for what it is and not what we might imagine it is. Um, so that will be that will be good fun, and I, and I do prom I do promise you um, that it is very likely that you that what you will hear next week is something you probably have never heard before, 
uh, mm -hmm. that Genesis 1 has a beauty and a richness that is revealed by historical scholarship, that a richness to it that trying to read it as a literalist account of the, a pre-scientific literalist account of the creation of the universe, that's not even what the text is about. And so if you try to approach it that way, you, you are literally missing the point, <laughs> okay? You're literally missing the point of the text and not hearing the text speak on its own terms, but rather in, you're, you're imposing on the text something that's actually foreign to it. Um, so, uh, but I, I really, I look forward to sharing uh, that with you next week. We're gonna have a great journey because, uh, you know, as you know, Bill said, he loves the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is so lovable. There's, there's so much in it. There's so many just wild stories and, and there's comedy, there's tragedy, there's, um, there's so much humanity and there's so much humanity in God, at least in the, in the J source anyway. There, there's so much humanity in God in the unfolding narrative of, of Genesis. So... All right. Well, uh, any comments or questions or thoughts that you'd like to share before we start to wrap up? I'm going to conclude with a prayer. So I, before I pray, I just want to make sure that everybody. Um, how many sessions do you have planned for this? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, I'm sorry to laugh like oh, that. You, but... you don't know? I mean, you just kind of. No, I don't. No, I, no, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I noted before um, before we started, really, that uh, our study of Matthew, when we when those of us who were going through it, going through Matthew, I mean, we we probably it probably took us eleven to twelve months, you know, doing okay. it. and and Matthew is shorter than Genesis is. Um, there's frankly a lot more to talk about in Genesis than there even was in Matthew. Uh, so. Um, and and a few you know, of us are willing to talk. Yeah, <laughs> right. Or right. ask questions. Well, yeah, not, not that you would know anything about have, that, of course. We have to make a commitment that we'll all stay well and we'll <laughs> all be here for probably a whole year. So that's, that's right. That's right. And, and listen, too, you know, if you aren't able, you know, if you have to take a, you know, take a break for a few weeks or whatever, you can always go to the, um, it, you can access it actually from the Friendship Presbyterian Church website, uh, go to friendship.org, go to friendship.org. And if you scroll to the bottom, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a logo there for YouTube. It says something to the effect of find us on our YouTube page or go to our YouTube page. Just click on that and that'll take you to the Friendship Presbyterian Church YouTube page where these Bible studies will be recorded, will be uh, uh, saved. Um, I created the world in six days, and you're not going to be able to review it that that, that quickly. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, and let's, and oh, thank sorry. you. Thank you for allowing me to join you. Oh. And next next time it will be quieter. The yard men don't usually come on Tuesday. So, <laughs> and it was it was pretty bad. <laughs> but, uh. Yeah. Oh, and let me just say though, uh, Phyllis Phyllis is coming to us from um, from Atlanta. Um, Phyllis is also uh, like almost everybody here except for my proud Auburn dad. Uh, a uh, UGA UGA devotee. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> oh, don't contradict me like I, that. I'm a tech you fan. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, you know, Tom was with us at Shallowford and was dearly loved there. So you all are very fortunate to have him. Well, thank you. I Indeed. Thank you very much. Well, and I think you should explain to everybody that I bring an Episcopalian viewpoint to this so that's yes. a little different you never know yeah absolutely absolutely uh i've always and i've always said to people that if i weren't presbyterian i'd be episcopalian so <laughs> our loss somehow <laughs> well I, for a long time i know we have to wrap up and i'll let let y'all go i'll just say that uh my dad knows this uh that long before lisa my wife lisa came into the picture um i was uh very very seriously involved with the daughter of an Episcopal priest. 
who uh, and it was back when I was um, back when I was coming out of college and going into seminary, and um, and he was he was putting the you know doing the hard sell and trying to talk me into switching churches and going to um, going to Episcopal uh, seminary instead of Presbyterian seminary. You persevered. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, and and eventually the, our relationship uh, didn't last. But uh, but it was it was an interesting episode in my earlier life. <laughs> so anyway, the other thing <laughs> is that one of the joys of this group is hearing some different viewpoints mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and talking about them, or um, it often adds a richness to whatever's being talked about. So true. So true. So it, it, and that was and that was just true in abundance uh going through the gospel of matthew because there's just so there's just so many suggestive things there and and so many things that are you know i mean we can we can dig into historical facts facts that don't change we can look at things that are constant but there's but with those facts there's so much there's so many different levels of meaning um that are that are much more subjective, um, but they, but when all put together and discussed and hashed through, uh, are just uh, wonderful, wonderful to explore. And uh, we'll see. Well, that's why it took us so long to get through math. To get through, <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. About it so much. <laughs> right, right. All righty. Well, I tell you what. Let's uh, let's let's go ahead and wind up, and uh, and I'll say a prayer, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll go about the rest of our day. And uh, again, I'll send the link to everybody uh, later on, but uh, just as a general rule, you can always go to the Friendship Church website, go to friendship.org, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and you'll see, find us on YouTube or, or something to that effect. Find us and click on that, and that'll take you to the church YouTube page where the videos will be found. So. Will this link to the Zoom be for all the classes or will there be a new link each time i'm going to send you i'm going to send you the link each week so you don't have to go okay. and find it but you but, don't have but to save question, it okay but the answer exactly. to your question is it is, every uh, week. is that the link does not change okay yeah but I, but I, just as a convenience as a convenience to you so you don't have to go find it i you just have it fresh in your inbox yeah you know every tuesday morning so Okay. Okay. All right, y'all. Well, uh, let's uh, let's have a prayer and then we'll uh, we'll be on our way. Oh God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather in this way, um, forced upon us by a pandemic, but at the same time, enabling folks as near as as near as uh, Athens and as far away as Carrollton and Atlanta to meet in one place and to talk with one another, get to know one another. We thank you for your word in scripture. We thank you for the book of Genesis and for the adventure that we're about to undertake. We pray that you, uh, that you inspire us, inform us, um, open us to, to new perspectives, to, the, to each other's perspectives as we, as we go through this book together. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank well, you. Thanks, everybody. And uh, good to see you, Dad. <laughs> Proudly sporting his Auburn, his Auburn sweater. Bye-bye. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Bye, everybody. Y'all have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.